I'm here with the guys from Eat the Turnbuckle to talk about the band, wrestling, and the upcoming. Can I say the upcoming? The upcoming documentary? I, I guess I can say yeah, that, yeah, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, the upcoming documentary. Got Eric here, the man behind the documentary. So we're going to get down in the weeds with these great dudes. But before we, we talk about the band, before we talk about the documentary, before we talk about the show in Philadelphia, because I want to mention that as well for the folks that want to attend, let me just say that the reason I'm sitting here today with you guys is because of my brother from another mother, Luke. I met this dude uh, in Iceland. Um, we were both there for Vak and Metal Battle. I was talking wrestling like I always do. And he's like, fuck, man, if you like this kind of music and you like wrestling, you got to check out Eat the Turnbuckle. Uh, specifically, uh, a video from Obscene Extreme. He said to me, you got to check out that video. You're going to fucking love it. And he wouldn't shut up about you guys the whole time that I was there. So when I got back to Canada, I check out the video on our YouTube channel. And then I sent him a message and said, like, fuck, you, were, you weren't joking. These guys, they really eat the turnbuckle. Let me just say, like, that was fucking crazy. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that in my life. I fucking loved it. And uh, and that's why we're here. So we're here because of him, the fucking guy that poured the gasoline in a diesel truck. Unreal. <laughs> Luke, uh, <laughs> Luke, Luke is the glue for many things involving this band. Ironically, yeah. as you've seen mm. the documentary. Yeah, it was. Uh, I actually sent him a message as soon as I was finishing uh, with the documentary, and I told him what a moron he was about that gas incident. Um, <laughs> and 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 I asked him if the penis thing was true or not, but he decided to plead the fifth on the penis part. Um, <laughs> but anyways, great dude. He he told me to say hi to you guys. He sends his love. He sends his greetings, and uh, and thank you all for taking the time um to talk to me about the band about the documentary um about everything that you guys done and let's start off with that obscene extreme video that we checked out on the channel uh get the tables was the name of the song the video is fucking sick uh th that performance there is part of the documentary but looking back at that performance how, how, where does that rank for you guys i mean uh considering the fact that Kirby fucking got a wrestling ring and got it on the stage. You know what I mean? I think that's would be the, the paramount would be the pinnacle of eat the turnbuckle, right? Have a ring on the stage the entire time, every show. But unfortunately, uh, that's, that's not very cost effective to have a fucking ring on every show. You know, we're not exactly Guar. We're better, but we're not exactly Guar. You know, so I would say the reason why Obscene Extreme was awesome, aside from the fact Everyone in the audience, in the crowd, are like-minded with the type of music we like. You know, crazy, battering, fucking, you know, extreme music. Fans are extreme. On top of the wrestling ring, you know, on top of the fact that everyone there is from all over the fucking planet. You know what I mean? You can't get a more exciting show than that. So that's probably why it's the pinnacle. Yeah, that was the, that was the best show we've ever done, no doubt about it. It, it, it ranks up there that high. Uh, I, I honestly, I, I enjoyed the video a lot. I thought you guys did a great job capturing that. And you guys did a great job capturing that in the documentary. And, and let's talk a little bit about the documentary. When when did you guys think that, hey, you know what? We need to document this band. We need to document our history. We need to document our journey so that everybody can see what the world needs to see in, in this kind of cool format, in this kind of cool presentation. I, I was talking to Eric before I started recording, and I mentioned that uh, I was a big fan of the vulgar display videos. I bought the videotape when Pantera released it in the early 90s, and it was a little bit like a tour diary, behind-the-scenes shit, and nobody had ever done anything like that. And I think you guys really capture that same vibe, that same essence with this documentary. So when 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 did the idea came about? No oh, one. Yeah, sort of. I mean, I I think it actually kind of spawned when we did that Vapor Fest in Denver. Remember when we did that um, with Cephalic Carnage and those guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we did. We played with Darkest Hour there, and Goldberg, one of those dudes, is your buddy, and he saw the show, and he saw we were like, we had one camera. I mean, we always filmed everything, but we had like one piece of shit camera that would fall over, and it sucked, and. Uh, your buddy from Darkest Hour was like, you guys are fucking idiots if you're not filming every single thing you guys are doing all the time. I did, yeah, I remember that. He, he was like, he was like, you have that one piece of shit camera. He's like, 
stop being an idiot, go buy like three or four GoPros and start putting them up every single show. And I, I was like, you know, the guy's got a fucking point. So we went out and bought three GoPros and we filmed every single thing we ever did. There was always two dedicated, one to the crowd, one to the stage, maybe another one somewhere else on the stage, but one of them always carried around with me so we could film yeah, you know, I don't know. Just and just like seeing, you know, Schlack talking to like just a normal person is worth filming because it's funny to see, you know, the reaction when they look at him. So, <laughs> um, those those Pantera DVDs or or VHS, whatever, those are like the Bible of home videos. I would say. I mean, I remember used to watch those shits religiously all the time. I still have them on fucking DVD. I mean, they're they were awesome and. I mean, I guess subconsciously, that's probably what we were trying to do. Or we actually were just being our jerk off selves the entire time. And by the way, you know what makes the Obscene Extreme show the best, besides the fact that there was a ring and the stage show? The gazebo in the back, where everyone's partying and doing blow in the trailer and shit. That's what really makes Obscene Extreme awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the extra party favor. So... You guys were starting to film shit up. You guys start bring this together, uh, recording all, all of this stuff, and I'm glad that you guys did. Uh, w when does Eric then come into the scene and you guys start to think, okay, now we kind of have to find a way of – because one thing is recording. The other thing is finding a way to present it in, in a somewhat cohesive way because I think the word cohesive and eat the turnbuckle don't really come in the same sentence. Well, um, I was into – yeah, I was introduced to Mike uh, kind of through a mutual connection. I've been doing video work since I, you know, since like 2014. Um, and a friend of mine said, hey, I got this guy that was in this insane, crazy band and he has all this video footage and he wants to turn it into something. And me and Mike had a had a talk. And I think this is about 2017, somewhere around there, maybe. Oh, something um, like that. Yeah, and he sat me down and he's like, yeah, here's everything, you know, here's, here, I have all these you know these two huge hard drives full of footage here's the story of the band um do you want to do something about it and i was like fucking absolutely man like it was one of the craziest things i've ever had another person tell me to my face kind of just the whole saga of eat the turnbuckle and i've been like a fan of music documentaries my whole life i love watching like uh rush beyond the lighted stage and you know um flight 666 and you know metal headbangers journey stuff like that so to have like the opportunity to tell a story this crazy from a band from philly you know kind of like you know homeland kind of stuff it was just it was something i had to do so you know we kind of talked about it over the next couple of years and then started i think we started filming like right before covid right happened before. and that kind of yeah and that kind of fucked things up a little bit but you know, we saw it through and took, it was, it was a long, crazy journey, but we got it done and, you know, really happy with how it turned out. Yeah. I asked, I asked Eric, I said, do you want, are you ready to dedicate the next five years of your life and maybe longer to eat the turnbuckle? And, and, uh, you know, I'm going to say, you're great. Yeah. <laughs> he, well, he, no. he, I'm assuming he didn't do it for the money or fame. So I, I'm just, that's, <laughs> no, <we're not>. <laughs> <laughs> that's just Never an assumption. Heard. Uh, did you guys work together in terms of of the editing in terms of of how you wanted the flow to go like how much of collaboration was there between eric and and you guys a, a good bit I, I, if you yeah. guys agree with that i mean like we kind of gave him a general idea of what we were looking for but he he took it and he kind of put it on a map and we started looking at it and going like okay cool you know we can kind of see where that's going and you know, obviously all of us, you know, we must have watched, we've probably seen the film like, uh, well, I don't know, 150 times now because we yeah. rewatch it, rewatch it, rewatch it, change this, change that. Let's move that to the beginning about, you know, so, but yeah, I, I would say there's a, a pretty big communal effort on the, uh, on the interaction of like everybody working together to try and make it go. But ultimately Eric took it, put it in its place. And we just kind of jumped in and we're like, Hey, what about this? What about that? But, you know, mm -hmm. he set the stone, you know, like. Yeah, yeah, Eric, kind of, uh, Eric basically polished the turd. We gave him fucking 1,700 hours of uh, yeah. <laughs> footage, and Eric uh, laid out the timeline and actually made a story of it, and it just not the complete utter nonsense. So uh, Eric is the uh, is the man for that. Yeah. When you Thank guys you. were putting when you guys were putting this together, and you see 
your work, your your literally your blood, sweat, and and tears coming to life in this documentary. Uh, did you start to think about okay, this this represents uh, our journey, this represents us, but what do we really want the end product to be? What is, what is the goal for us? Is it just to tell a story, or is or do you guys deep inside have uh, you know a little bit more of an ambitious goal? And putting this out there, not just for fans, but for people in the extreme metal community to take a, ch a look at. Uh, I think, I, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, I, I don't want to say this is. You know, I don't say we made an error before, but I think we kind of missed the boat on something this cool and this grandiose with all of our other bands. You know what I mean? Like we were fucking complete morons, not filming every single second behind stage. You know, on the stage, all over the place. We kind of missed the boat because, you know, that's when the bet shit happens is when you're just fucking off, sucking around. But yeah. luckily, this was like, you know, the uh, culmination of years of fucking up and making errors with our other bands. And we finally harnessed it and put it together. You know what I mean? I, uh, it, it you know, it, hard road traveled. I, I think, mm -hmm. you know, we, we learned from our mistakes and, and, you know, we got a nice product out of it. I, I, what's really cool about it is, I feel like Eric captured that it's like a it's like an almanac for old South Jersey, Philly, Delaware bands that would have just get lost in the seas of fucking time. But because that old document or that old footage of those old bands that we were all previously in got dug up and put in the beginning of the documentary, I think it's going to save the life of those. And maybe it could pique the interest of other people once they see the documentary. Like, oh, let me look this up. Um, Dead Gerber Babies. That band looks pretty cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, think, I think that's one of the really cool things about the documentary is it will add shelf life and it'll cement those bands that, you know, would have probably just got lost. Yeah, a band, a band like this doesn't just like happen at, like with like five dudes who have never been in anything else. And all of a sudden you've got that you have to be like years and years of being a piece of shit to like come up with something like this and right on the road well i mean like and i mean that with like love you know like mm -hmm. you're not gonna take something like this and travel with it for seven or eight years you know it's it's just not gonna fucking happen but i think the like the origin of putting it together to answer your question what's the goal with it personally my goal was i had two big fucking hard drives full of footage that were taking you know collecting dust in one of my drawers i was like this is such a waste like we killed ourselves for years just so that this can sit in my drawer. Uh, you know, it seems silly not to do something with it. What's the end goal? I have no fucking idea, but it needed to happen. It needed to get made. We needed to put it out there. If something cool happens from it. If it gets picked up, if it goes to like a big stream, th that's amazing. That's awesome. But more importantly, it just, I wanted it to be made and everybody else wanted it to be made. So we fucking made it. And you know, we're we're going to try and see if we can really get it where it needs to go. But we're going to put it in all the film festivals. We're going to do all the work that you need to do when you make a film. But on the flip side, you know, more importantly, I just wanted it to happen. I, I wanted I wanted the world and I'm sure everyone in the band is in agreement. We wanted to show the world how much of a piece of shit we really are. <laughs> yeah. First hand. I, I, I would be shocked if this doesn't get picked up by a streaming service. I'll be shocked. You know what I mean? Like this is like We're great liability. entertainment. Like I'm. Mean, it I, captures a scene that no one else has ever really done. No, it, and, and from a very organic point of view, do you know what I mean? It doesn't. It doesn't come across manufactured. It doesn't come across put together in a way that it was always meant to be put together. If you if you understand where I'm coming from, mm -hmm. I, I felt like I was there with you guys. Like I, I felt like I was going through your experiences with you it, it it had that voyeuristic aspect to it that works really well when you're telling a story and and the people telling the story are the people living the story which which I, it's not very common mm -hmm. yeah I, it's, I, you know it's fun because it's like when we look at it we a lot like a lot from just experiencing it and being there all the time. It's like, I, I look, I'm sure you guys think of the same thing. I, I look at it and go, Oh, there's so much crazier shit that happened. It's not in here. Oh, yeah. That should be. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, that's the X rated DVD version. That's yeah. the editor's cut. That's what Eric comes in with the editor's cut. And then right. re-releases like in, in the 10 year anniversary or something <laughs> like that. So you can make some there extra you know. money. 
that, that's, that's all that's the, how you, that's all the that's footage you that got that's all the shit that got deleted immediately right. yeah. <laughs> it, when you guys were were reliving this when you guys were working with eric and saying okay can you move this over here move this over there was there anything that you guys re-saw and relived in that moment that was like holy shit man i forgot about that and like almost shed a tear because you guys are all tough dudes i don't think you guys cry but almost shed a tear um i don't know i mean just the whole thing really in general i think eric did a really good job of i mean it's like essentially what are we doing we're getting fucked up we're being assholes and breaking things breaking each other you know but eric ended it ended it to a way to where it was kind of like the little engine that could like at the end you're like it's like heartwarming you're like wow these guys they really did it because <laughs> what, what was what was he to turnbuckle it, it was just a fucking crazy punker band full of assholes that really shouldn't have got out of bars you know what i mean that show was you know 100 fucking 50 people rock club fucking type thing but for some odd reason because of all the people we know from the tenure we've had over years and years and years in asshole bands and all the people we know, it somehow mirac miraculously through all the connections, like Luke is a is a pretty big part of it. Yeah. It somehow yeah. got to the point of where we're playing with fucking Iron Maiden in, in another country. You know what I mean? And yeah. I think Eric did a really good job of capturing that little engine that could and got us a whole bunch of empathy in the film that we don't really deserve. <laughs> that, was, I, that was like the most surprising part i think put, putting this together like figuring out what the story actually was is like how inspiring and how much of a testament to like you know setting your mind to something and just like doing it and not giving a fuck about anything else you know it's like that kind of whole journey from the bottom to the top and then just kind of gone you know it was it that was like it, it just it almost you know it lent itself to the the cinematic aspect of it all you know uh, Eric, it, it were, cool were you that. ever worried that if you fucked this over, the guys would suplex you through a table? I was hoping they would. Nobody did, though. <laughs> well, there's still time. <laughs> April 4th. Yeah. Eric, you're going down. Oh, shit. All right. <laughs> yep. There's always time to. for that. So don't, don't uh, you know, don't talk too soon. Like, you never know what's going to yeah. happen. Uh, I, I, as I'm watching this documentary, there's certain things that I'm like, there's no way they're going to do this because this is just not – an intelligent thing to do when you're on tour and i'm i'm thinking to myself every every band that i know uh when they're on tour they're super careful they have like this specific diet they do their yoga they do all of this shit because nobody wants to get sick and i'm thinking these guys <laughs> if like what the fuck are they thinking somebody's gonna break a leg or a, or a foot and <laughs> exactly and i'm like and then the tour is it uh, like what's happening to the rest of the tour as i'm thinking that you break your foot uh, as, as I'm watching. I'm like, oh my god, like, like where am I, Nostradamus here? But I don't think it takes, uh, uh, you know, uh, Nostradamus to figure it out that something like that could happen. I, I don't think that ever crossed your minds. Did you guys ever worry about any of that shit at all? I think it's the the exact opposite. We would push it to the next limit every night because we we could get bored of it. Honestly, we need to do something over the top like to, to us this shit's kind of normal and every night we're like all right what can we do tonight it's gonna be crazier than last night we feed off the show man the the bigger the show the crazier the people the, the more willing we are to forget that we could get seriously hurt so yeah <laughs> wow slack uh, slack knows more than anybody you put him in front of fucking five people cut his head. <laughs> you put him in front of a hundred people who cut his head off yeah <laughs> I just feel like a lot of the times it was kind of like, you know, we, we we like let's invent something new. What can we do here that hasn't been done? I feel like that's what how we would roll all the time. Yeah. Did, did you guys I know you guys obviously didn't care for your well-being, but did you care for the the gear? Was there any concern like okay, we're going to do this? Not. <laughs> no, not at all. No. No. We rented it. <laughs> it's rental it. gear. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Gates of Hell gear yeah. rent from Germany. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. What's funny about Eat the Turnbuckle is um, there's a lot of things over the years that I've learned personally. I mean, I don't know. I can't speak for Mike. I don't play drums, but little things that you don't run in contact with when you're in other bands. Like every two nights, I would have to change the strings on my guitar. Unlike, you know, those things could last for four, you know, in another band. But because I would bleed 
and blood would get on like the e string that's wound. Blood would like dry up inside the fucking in the string, and it, I would get like one or two shows out of it max, and it would dampen the sound, and there would be no resonance. So like that doesn't happen in any other band, you know, because you don't exactly have blood, dried blood on everything. I'm sure the same could apply with a microphone. Yeah, yeah. we need a new microphone every every time we go out. It's the same thing, you know. I know you guys travel because it, it's it's shown on the documentary that you guys travel with the gear, with doors, with with uh, light tubes, with barbed wire. I, I mean, I thought it was incredible that you get, you guys have a trailer for the for the gear, like the the band gear and merch, and then you have a trailer for the wrestling gear. <laughs> I, never, I thought that was fucking. I think that was like that was pretty early. That was pretty early on, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And that you're like first. I, before I was in the band, you guys did a tour in the beginning where I think you had. Yeah, one. towards the end, we were just in a Sprinter van with everything packed in. <laughs> yeah, in the in the states, we have a van and we have a trailer. I mean, don't don't get me wrong; it was still a, it was a tight fucking squeeze. But you know, trying to travel around with like sixty light tubes in the back of a trailer without them exploding all over everything was pretty challenging. We built like a net system in the top of the trailer so that they could kind of just bounce with the trailer, and they were wrapped in foam. And you know, we we did what you know. You know, uh, fans are known for asking Benz to sign shit. Did anybody ask you guys to sign some two by fours or anything like that after a show? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. One guy has a, has a whole door above his mantle, doesn't he? Or in his no, it's above his. If it's it, no, it's Steve. And it's above his bed. And he, it's a door with it's all the signs. He looks at it when he fucks his wife. <laughs> That's all over the country, man. I'm, there's there's like a, in the um the dive bar in Vegas. There's yeah. half a door. On the wall still from the East Turnbuckle show with everyone's blood on it and signs and shit. It's yeah. It, you know, for, for those that are not aware, furniture porn is a thing. So having yeah. a, a a door above your bed is not completely out of the realm of possibility. Another thing that I discovered during those nights of watching YouTube videos and going down the <laughs> rabbit hole. So uh, <laughs> the uh, you guys also had some of the former members of the band on on the on the documentary, which I thought was really cool. Um, was was that easy to do was that something that you guys thought about it eric thought about it? how was that process because sometimes there could be some bad blood it didn't come across that way everybody seemed really cool in the documentary but uh, how was the, the process we tricked them into showing up <laughs> and then we put a camera in their face and started asking them questions no i don't know they're they're yeah. cool you guys can yeah i don't say everybody was everybody was cool through the whole process i mean it was important to have everybody that's been in the band be there because you know I, I really wanted to the, the whole story of the band was so um is like a domino effect it's like every everything needed to happen the way it happened for it to happen you know so getting really trying to find out where the band started and where it ended up was really important to me as far as putting this thing together um so yeah we had to you know we had to have ant-man we had to have chris in there um you know because they were they were there when the band started you know i mean they didn't make it to the end but that was still like they, the band wouldn't have been where it was without them so you know they were all they were all really cool about it and you know they were as as excited about it as the rest of us were i mean and you guys sorry go those, ahead those are all dudes that we've all known for 20 30 years you know what i mean it's not like just because we're not in a band together and maybe one guy thinks this other guy's a piece of shit that doesn't negate the fucking 30 years that we've known each other you know what i mean so everyone's of Everyone's still cool. They're, everyone's still cool with each other. Yeah. Like whatever the reason was for the for them to not be in the band anymore, that was kind of at that time and at that place. But everyone's still good, you know. Yeah, it came across we, that way. That's for sure. Uh, no, nobody aired their grievances, so I, everything came out copacetic. So that's cool. Uh, sure. you, you know, you mentioned that you guys recorded a lot of stuff, but there was some stuff that you guys didn't record. Do, do you have any stories that didn't make the documentary that? stand out in your mind as like, man, I wish we had had a camera that day and recorded that bit. Well, there's a lot of that. There's um, a lot of that, yeah. yeah there was I, one one story that I wish y'all had footage of was, um, I think it was earlier on, it might have been before Mike was in the band, but there was uh, some bar somewhere that had like big casks of wine or something. Uh, Somebody got pushed into them and like knocked the, the thing or knocked the thing over and it spilled like this rancid wine all over the bar and everybody was throwing up. Ant-Man was telling me about that one. Oh yeah. It was like it was like 250 year old wine or something. Yeah, <laughs> it was like all rotted and, and like rancid and yeah. <laughs> it was like absolute shit. Gutter was vomiting all over the place. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That's what I want footage of. 
I don't wish, remember anything. <laughs> I, w- I wish we had a camera in um, Slovakia when we played with Bruheria. And uh, right after we played, we kind of like took over the only dressing room that was in there. And we're all covered in blood. And the girl that was with Bruheria came in and she like started, She, I mean, like she like turned green. She had like a huge blood phobia and we were like bleeding all over the green room. She like, she had to take off and fucking run out of there. That was pretty, that was funny. And, you know, probably- <laughs> It, we didn't have we didn't have cameras on all of our American tours. We when we toured with the Mentors and all and the Fang and everybody mm-hmm. and the Murder Junkies, we didn't have cameras for any. And there was a lot of debauchery that took place on all that. Right? I think it was. I think it was when I joined the band with you guys, and you know we did that first U.S. tour, and we immediately went out and got cameras, and then started filming everything. But yeah, you guys missed a lot of good shit. I bet. I mean, we had Soap was there a couple times. Soap would come out with us and and film the show. Yeah, but you, I, me, and Chubb, we're fucking useless. We just get completely hammered every single day, and you know, so we're not filming much. When the documentary gets to the end, is when you guys are are going to Vakken to play at Vakken, and 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 there's some really cool quotes from you guys in terms of what it means for any band, but what it means for you guys to like be playing at a festival like that. Uh, when when you look back at that experience. More than the experience of playing there, what do you feel like other bands looked at you guys and felt? Because I'm, I'm sure the fan base went nuts. You guys had a great time. But what was your experience, not just from a fan point of view, but also from the other bands looking at you guys and looking at what you guys bring to the table, which is something that nobody else does? I mean, they were probably looking at us. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> They put us up in a hotel and at, at, at walking um, where all the bands stay and we get back there and there's the bars open 24 seven. And it's like sponsored by Jägermeister. And we're like, this is going to be great. We're going to party with all these bands all night. And we sat, I mean, we sat there to what, like five, six in the morning watching bands come in and go right up to their, their rooms. We're the only ones in this fucking bar all night. Like, <laughs> man, this, this really isn't how I pan like pictured it going down. <laughs> It didn't live up to your expectations. Well, the no. party part of it, no. <laughs> the show was great. I mean, the yeah, show the, was fun, the but the after, was awesome. the after yeah. part is nothing yet. Yeah. I, I don't think you guys are an easy band to follow. Like, you really want to be the guys that come after Eat the Turnbuckle. I, I don't think I want to be that band. He, even the mentors, when we did a tour with them, the mentors, their whole entire career – Part of their like thing was they played last because they're you know the guys that teach you a lesson. When we were on tour after show two, they were like, you know what, we'll play before you guys because even the mentors didn't want to fucking play after us. That's kind of you know, further in the cap right there because yeah, I mean, what, what do you guys do on stage with the the energy that you guys bring, the show within the show? I I don't want to I don't want to come after that. Like there's just like. There's uh I'm gonna be a disappointment. You know, it's sloppy seconds afterwards. It just doesn't work. It's also dangerous. You might step on a tack or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true too. Or slip <laughs> on the blood and break a neck or something. Yeah, right. we fucked that stage up pretty good when we play. Yeah. There was a show in Philly that we opened. It was like the greatest show. Remember, it was the anti nowhere league, meat men and, and and this other band. And we we you know, we went on first it's Philly and we were just psyched to play the show. The band that played after us was like visibly upset that they had. They were like, "Why the fuck would they put us on after you guys?" I don't get like because they weren't like a big band or anything. And we're like, <laughs> "Oh, because you're on tour," and they're like, "Yeah," but they, they were like seriously mad, like that they had to play. And then just to add, you know, the insult to everything, uh, Tesco V later, he's like, you know. He's like, how about Eat the Turnbuckle? And people are like, yeah. And he's like, how about that band that had to play after Eat the Turnbuckle? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even say their name. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> wow. it, it, is, is it, was it hard to book some venues? Because, you know, and that's well documented in the documentary that some places you guys couldn't play, uh, shows got canceled, things of that nature. But was that a common occurrence? Because you guys didn't leave. I'm sure you guys didn't leave the venues in in pristine condition. See, that that was the key. That was the key. Is me and Jay, we uh, 
you know, we know a shit ton of people and everyone in the band has had tenure, you know, playing music for years. So we know a lot of the, the, the fucking venue owners and big time promoters and shit. So it was kind of like, you kind of, come on, man, we won't wreck everything. I swear. Come on. All right. And because they know us, they're like, all right, just let them fucking play. That was like part of the fucking, the puzzle that why this band could never be recreated because we just happen to fucking know everyone so we can get away with practically fucking murder. And then we got, you know, we would, who would other fucking touring company would, in the right mind, would try and build a tour for Eat the Turnbuckle overseas. That's why Luke is the goddamn man, because in all reality, he was stupid enough to be like, you know what, fuck it, I'm going to put my neck on the line, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to book a tour with these guys because it would have never happened without him. You know, we just and Luke has a ton of connections, you know, in Europe, so it just so happened, you know, I know this guy, Jay knows this guy, Mike Beer knows this guy, and and get away with fucking murder. We did have some challenges, though. Not to say that never happened. Like, you know, some venues, maybe we didn't have as tight a connection with as we thought, and they'd maybe watch a video. They'd be like, (laughs) but, uh, you know, we're also, you know, like, whatever we present on stage is one thing. Like, we're not total. We're not trying to wreck your venue. We're trying to put on the show. Like, you throw us a broom and a mob, and we'll help when we're done. We're not like, you know, we're not animals, but, you know. Well, uh. Well, I mean, that was... (laughs) Like in the beginning of the documentary, that was part of the Eat the Turnbuckle, the creation of why we went in the wrestling direction. Because yeah. all our other bands were just fucking break everything, act like total jerk off. So yeah. we had to figure out a way how we can still be able to play in these places and get away with bleeding all over the place and, you know, acting like grown children. And it was through wrestling rather than just. G.G. Allen, you know what I mean? So, grew you, know, up. Little, you know, what yeah. the fuck are you playing? I grew but up. What, the tour we did where we did a, the whole tour that we promoted fans bring the weapons and the clubs weren't so psyched on that tour, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a possible a legal issue with people bringing bats and all sorts. I can only it, imagine that. It helped us out a lot because then, you know, I think, was it in Europe we did that? Because then we didn't have to buy any weapons kind of started <laughs> like the fans bring them started happening at every show thankfully so it saved yeah. us a lot of hassle but there, there was one where we promoted it and i remember some of the clubs were like what the fuck does that mean you know like <laughs> and, and was, a, 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 <laughs> april 4th in philadelphia you guys are having the final battle royale um uh, let, let me ask you guys this uh, you you guys are labeling this the final battle royale but i've also heard from CM Punk in the past that he would never go back to WWE. The guy's back on WWE now. So I guess never say never. Is this <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So is, is this really going to be the final battle Royale or there's like a slim hope and chance that someday, somehow there'll be a return. I mean, dude, as of now, there's no plans. Uh, yeah. yeah. You, but, you, never... you know, go ahead. Just like, go ahead. I'm saying you never know, like just like CM Punk, you know what I mean? Uh, Make it worth my while dealing with all these guys again and make it worth their while dealing with me. And uh, sure, we'll we'll, we'll (laughs) get fucking wagon and we'll get over there and we'll we'll do the goddamn thing. You know what I mean? Just make it worth our while. You know, we're not exactly 22 years old anymore. Right. (laughs) This this lined up perfectly. Like. We were talking before this uh, WrestleMania is in Philly this this year. That's we're gonna we're gonna kick it off Thursday night with this show. So all you know, there's gonna be all kinds of wrestlers in town for it, and and we're gonna uh, it's gonna be known as Eat the Turnbuckle Weekend from now on instead of WrestleMania Weekend. Yeah, I, I want to change my my line of questioning now and and include a little <laughs> bit of wrestling questioning here because you just gave me the perfect segue. If you guys got approached by either WWE or AEW, talking about the two probably bigger promotions right now, at least in North America. Uh, and, and they said to you, we have a wrestler that wants to use you one of your songs for the walkout song. Uh, would you guys be cool with that? Do you think, is there a wrestler out there that de- that is deserving of having your music as their walkout music? Jay? Sure. Yeah, yeah. And anyone if WWE wants to use our music, I mean that's probably the biggest paid fucking day that you could get, right? 
<laughs> well, right now, uh, you know, we have this huge XPW sponsorship, and they, they play our, you know, our music all the time. Schlack right there is the XPW champion of the uh, – he's the deathmatch champion, and, um, and he's now the belt. heavyweight champion. Go he's got – hold on. Here he goes. So we, we do have like a, a – a, we work with XPW right now just because, uh, you know, the champ is in the band. He's in the building. He's just momentarily out of out of camera. He went to go take a dump. He went to get the the. the there we the go. Belt. A thousand raw eggs. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, two goddamn belts at the same goddamn motherfucker. <laughs> wow, that is Hell fucking yeah. cool. That is fucking cool. Um, yeah, uh, the, the 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 final battle royal bloodbath on April fourth in Philadelphia is uh going to be live streamed on streamxpw.com. And obviously, XBW is going to be sponsoring that. And so the entire world is going to be able to watch it in real time for a small amount of money. We don't know what the fucking, we haven't figured out the specifics yet. But, you know, we're not going to cheat the world of the craziest shows that has ever happened in the history of live music. There's going to be a battle royal of some of the craziest deathmatch wrestlers on the fucking planet while Eat the Turnbuckle plays on WrestleMania weekend. I mean, if the bucket plants couldn't possibly align more, you know, I, 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 I don't know what to say beyond that. So live stream, streamxpw.com, everyone's going to have a chance to see the entire show, not just Eat the Turnbuckle's final performance, but you're going to get to see Ringworm, you're going to get to see Anti-Scene, you're going to get to see Ground, who is a sick, sick fucking New Jersey grindcore band, uh, DB. And you're going to get to see Fang, the legendary punk band. Plus, we may have a couple no ring death matches in between sets. I don't know yet. Still working on specifics, but loaded with fucking shit. This is going to be the most insane show of all time. And you can fucking, I'll, I'll, I'm going to guarantee it. Are you bringing your belt? Damn right, I'm bringing my belt. I'm the fucking champ. All right. That's what I wanted to hear. That's what I wanted to hear. Uh, if, if you guys were a faction, if you guys were a wrestling faction, who, in the history of wrestling factions, who, who would you guys be beefing with? We are a wrestling faction. We're eating the turnbuckle. <laughs> <laughs> who are we beefing with? The world. Yeah, fuck. Gore. Yeah. We like to beef I, I with any other think, bands. I don't think they have anything on you guys, to be yeah. honest. We're going to start entering some Battle of the Bands. <laughs> and actually... <laughs> <laughs> The problem with with entering battling of the bands is that you guys would actually take that shit literally, and and, yeah. and, and that's and that would be the the game changer right there for you guys. That would it be said, the game changer right there. I mean, it said battle right there on the flyer. You know, that is true. That is true. Uh, you guys mentioned very briefly on the documentary. One of you guys mentioned very briefly on the documentary how shitty the music business is. Uh, which one is more cutthroat? Do you feel the wrestling business or the the or the extreme music business? Oh man, uh, wrestling. I mean, we, me and Jay, we're also tattooers, like long, long time tattooers. So that's also another gnarly, you know, business that's also very cutthroat and very carny. But in all honesty, as backstabbing as music can possibly be as backstabbing as tattooing can be wrestling is shoo is very very cardy i mean pretty much essentially all three of those were during the carnival you know back in the day when carnivals were touring around the united states and shit like that um they were sideshow things all designed to fucking rob people of their money wrestling they would do wrestling they would have tattooers you know stuff like that so i mean it's all built to be thievery you know what i mean so it's all and what's who who does thievery backstabbing thieves bro but i would probably say wrestling is probably the most cutthroat gnarly because everyone's especially nowadays dude no one wants to fucking work with each other it's in the music industry too everyone will tread on everyone around them just to get themselves to the top but if everyone helps everybody everyone rises to the top of the fucking you know cesspool together but no one likes to do that these days for for the show on uh, on April fourth, I'm assuming you guys are gonna have merch there. Uh, fans can come out, pick up some merch, uh, see the show. 
meet you guys, maybe get a door signed by all of you, whatever, whatever, uh, whatever they fancy. Uh, as you guys look ahead beyond April 4th, which you said it's going to be the Eat the Turnbuckle weekend, no, no longer the WrestleMania weekend. As you guys look forward and you close this chapter, uh, what, what is next for you guys? We're going to keep pushing this film. I mean, uh, Eric can probably shed a little more light on it, but we have, you know, 20 or 30 film festivals that we have submitted or ha are going to submit to and see who wants to show it see, you know, see what comes of that, shop it around, you know, but mostly just put it in front of people, put asses in seats and let them watch the film and see what they think. And hopefully it gets some buzz. So, um, it's something that I, I think people need to hear. It's a story that people should hear. I think it's a story that people will want to hear. So yeah, just get as many people as possible to watch it and, you know, learn about what these guys did to themselves for, you know, decades, however many decades they did it for. <laughs> so to answer your question, Hollywood, brother, that's where it's headed next. <laughs> Damn right. I really hope so. I mean, I, I'm hoping for two things right now. One is that Netflix picks this shit up. And two is that somehow somebody makes a real life story movie about, about you guys. Because this is like what I saw in that, that in that documentary, the world deserves to see it. The world needs to see it. It was it was so entertaining, it was so gripping. It it, it was it, it, it's hard to put it to words because I, I like I said, I felt like I was in the trenches with you guys. It was it was heartwarming to a certain degree to see the level of, of commitment that you guys had with one another and with the band in general in terms of what your vision was, what you guys wanted to deliver, and, and sticking to it through the ups and downs, sometimes perhaps more downs than ups. But, you know, out, outstanding outstanding job in, in recording it and having the vision to put it together and then finally putting the damn thing actually together. So congratulations on all of you for what you've done i wish you all nothing but the best with this documentary i really hope you guys get the recognition for all the work you guys have put in thank you brother yeah yeah and even and, if we don't we made it so we're stoked that we're and, stoked. and one and one last note before we go make sure you send me all the links that you guys want to have in the description of the video so folks can pick up the stream they can go catch you guys live on april 4th if they are in the philadelphia area i think yeah. this would be a great way to really get that whole weekend going what better way to see you guys live on this final show but please send me an email with all the links i'll make sure they'll be in the description of this video because for the life of me, anybody that's willing to listen, I'll be spreading the word of Eat the Turnbuckle and of this documentary. It's absolutely phenomenal shit. I've never been this entertained in my life watching a documentary that didn't have Morgan Friedman as the narrator. So I we absolutely tried. love it. We yeah. tried. We could only get Larry Legend. <laughs> but <now> Larry Legend. <laughs> well, you know, maybe next time. Maybe next time. Yeah. For, for, for the sequel. For the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys thank you very much for your time today thank you oh, thank yeah, you man thanks for having thank us you.